Well, good morning. Well, it is truly great to see all of you here together as we gather to worship our God. My name is Reed. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, before we get started with digging into God's Word, I'm going to have the kids go ahead and stand up. And they can head out to their classes, out this front door with their teachers. Well, it's always a joy when I can have uh, my parents here. Many of you know them. Uh, they're, they're visiting, uh, not to see me, I know that, but to see our, uh, my children. Uh, but they have their spring break uh, this week, and so the, my parents got to come out and visit us. And I wasn't planning on making my dad preach uh, because I thought I'd give him a break. It's vacation. Um, but I, I got hit with some sickness. I don't know what it was. Uh, and so I called him, and it's great to have a dad who can last minute uh, be able to uh, step in and fill in. And so I, uh, for your benefit, I know that you in, always enjoy hearing him speak. Um, there's not a man that's impacted my life more uh, than my dad. And I know that over the years that we have been here and he's come to visit and preach God's word to you and interacted that you have uh, benefited from uh, his life and ministry uh, as well. And so this morning you get to hear from the original Pastor Olson, um, and I know that you'll be blessed by it. So I'm going to have him come and bring God's word to us. Good morning. You know, you really make it hard on a guy. I try to learn names and faces, and every time I come back, there are more people. <laughs> but uh, it is an exciting thing. I was telling Diane, it was three years ago that we first uh, drove out. They had the U-Haul full, and, and uh, Reed and Heather came out and came to the first service. And uh, what a blessing that was. But then to see uh, new faces, people, people come to Christ, uh, and gathering on Sunday, and we get to hear all about it. Uh, as we stay in touch with them. You know, it's interesting that um, I always wanted to have one of those bumper stickers in Colorado. It says native Colorado. And I, and I, co I couldn't because I wasn't born in Colorado. But Reed could because he was born in Colorado. But uh, I was born in California. So it, we kind of we switched. And um, it's good to be home. We, we love being in California and uh, especially with God's people and being with you here this Sunday. So we look forward to opening God's Word. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to the Gospel of John chapter 13. And you think about the month that we have of March, and a lot of things happen. We move the clocks this week. I think we start uh, spring on the 21st. We'll have our first day of spring. And, of course, March Madness, if you're into the basketball thing, your team may already be out of it, but... Uh, a lot of things will happen in the spring, but particularly for the church, we celebrate Easter. And Easter is the most significant day that we celebrate throughout the year and always has been since the resurrection of Christ. And so we want to make much of that. I think that would please the Lord to make much of that, to celebrate the day that Christ rose from the grave and we think about ways we can do that. And it's not that we necessarily have to go do something, but to point to Jesus and what he has accomplished. And you, when we read the scripture, we think of the, the many ways that God reveals himself to you. And no better way does God reveal himself to you than through his son, Jesus. And it's interesting, as we read through the scriptures, We'll use this, this word, behold. I know it's, it's not a common word, uh, behold, but in other words, look at something, stop and think about this, and let it kind of settle into your soul. Contemplate all that's happening. So when we talk about the Lord being revealed, we read these words, behold the child. We think of that at Christmas. Behold the man that God has become man. Behold your king, he is the king that is promised. And we read, behold your God, he is God come in the flesh. But this morning we're going to look in chapter 13 and really see this concept, behold my servant. And this may be the most difficult term for us to process because servant really, we, if we translate this, to say slave someone who takes the lowest position. 
The context of our story here in John 13 is the upper room. This is the time where Jesus has the Last Supper or has the communion. This is where he instituted this with his disciples. It is also the place where we find him washing their feet. And I think that you can take this entire chapter and, and boil it down to the first and opening verse. And so we're going to look at this first verse of chapter 13 and unpack it. It really gets unpacked throughout the whole, the whole chapter. But when you think of the word servant, or doulos in the Greek, uh, I, I noticed at the uh, Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, they call all the freshmen doulies. I don't know if you knew that, they call them doulies, but it comes from the Greek doulos. In other words, you're a slave. <laughs> that, and that typically happens. When you come in, uh, you don't have any rights, you don't have any privileges. And this is how Jesus defines himself. And all of those that are following him in leadership throughout the Bible, he talks about my servant. Now, it's easy to just say that word, but then when you, you start to think through what does that mean that Jesus was a servant, and when he says, follow me, he wants us to live in that very same way. Slaves would become slaves in the ancient world by being conquered by another nation, or because they were a criminal, or because they had incurred a great amount of debt but basically it meant you have no rights you have no possess you have no possessions you have no privileges and you really do the bidding of someone else i think that rubs against all of us <laughs> we we don't like being told what to do we like to be in control of things but a servant a slave is doing the bidding of another and this is the life that Jesus lived on earth, and this is the life he calls you to. And I can promise you that your flesh is going to fight it. But how we live that life like Christ lived his life reveals to the rest of this city what Jesus is really like and what he did. And it is really the only way that we can follow him. John 13 and on through 17 is what we call the farewell discourse. It begins in the upper room and it continues on as he leaves, goes down through the Kidron Valley to, the, to Gethsemane, and then as he is arrested at, at Gethsemane and taken off into the court with Caiaphas and before Pilate and so forth. But a, a lot of the Gospel of John is given to describing what he says. His, his last words, his final words, his, his last communication to his disciples. And it's interesting, probably if you were there, they'd be nodding their heads and they're not getting it. <laughs> and they really don't get it until after the resurrection. It, it all starts to, to become clear to them, but we go back after the resurrection, oh, that's what he meant, that's what he was talking about. And so it's kind of fun to be able to do that. So verse 1, let me read verse 1 uh, to us this morning of chapter 13. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So this verse really sums up what we're going to read in the rest of chapter 13. And we'll point to a few of those parts of this. But, but I'd like to just kind of anchor our thoughts in this verse. And we see three ways that Jesus came to serve. He served the Passover. In other words, here he is. It's like, you know, put the apron on. He's serving the meal, the Last Supper, the Lord's table. He is serving the Passover. Secondly, he's serving his father. His father sends him. He does the will of his Father. And then finally, he serves the world, particularly the disciples, but expanded on this thought, he really comes to serve the world by the giving of his life. So, serving the Passover. Um, we read these opening lines, before the Passover festival. Well, this kind of gives us context of what is happening in Jerusalem. Everyone is coming to town. 
And I don't know if you've lived in a place where you have special events where everyone comes to town. You say, I don't want to get out of the traffic. But we have events that people will travel and come to uh, big, big get-togethers or celebrations. And this was the biggest celebration of the year for Jews. Everyone over all of the nations around the world that Jews had scattered to would come to this Passover. So you could call it chaos. <laughs> you could call it excitement. You could call it a lot of things. But there were a lot of people. Um, maybe traffic jams, uh, so to speak. Long lines everywhere you go. You think, oh, we forgot. Today was the Passover. But everyone is coming to town. Hotels, uh, places are filled. People are taking others in. And they are here to do this. And, and, and what's interesting is that there's the buying and selling of sacrificial animals. Uh, so the marketplaces are busy. Uh, Money is being exchanged. And, and in all of the excitement, it's easy to forget of what this is about. I've thought about that with Christmas. I've thought about that with Easter. That many of the celebrations that we have and, and the food and the get-togethers and, and the fun that we have we can forget why we're celebrating. And I'm sure that that was the case here during this time. We got in Tuesday, and uh, Reed and Landon and I went to the Kings game because they were playing the Bucks. And uh, Landon, as is, is young as he is, he still knew what was happening. He, knew, he knows who Giannis is. He knows what he's doing. He's, he sees all those moves. And I had to laugh because I remember back to when the Colorado Rockies <clears throat> had their inaugural season. This, I think, was back in, like, 93. And I took our, our daughter, Sarah, to the game. She just wanted to go to a Rockies game. And so we went downtown Denver, went to the game, and she's wanting cotton candy and the red ropes and the, getting the, another Diet Coke. Or You know, we're, we're uh, just having fun. Beautiful day. She's laughing, looking and talking about all the things. And, and we, we got to... The car at the end, we stayed through the whole game, walked around, looked at things, and we're driving home, and she said, that was so much fun, Dad. We need to do that again. And then a little pause, and she said, who won the game? <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's the difference between girls and boys. Boys would be into the game. But she just got, she, it was the whole experience. But I think as Christians, we can enjoy all the experience of it and forget the central truth. And we drift to that. We drift, we, we drift into that with the chaos that's taking place. So the Passover, why is everyone coming to Jerusalem? Well, they've been celebrating this for 1,400 years. Go all the way back to the time of Moses when he is delivering the Hebrew people out of Egypt. And do you remember those stories? Many of you will remember those stories. But part of that was the night that, that, that God brought judgment upon Egypt. And when God brings judgment on sin, he will always provide a way of mercy. This is the beauty of God. You know, we talk about God as a God of wrath. He hates sin. And that is true. You read through the Old Testament. You're going to see that God does not tolerate sin, but he always provides a way of mercy. And he, here's what he said to the people. I'm going to pass over you. It's the angel of death is going to be passing over all of Egypt, and judgment is going to come. But if you take the blood of a lamb, a spotless, perfect lamb, and take that blood and put it on the top of the door and on the two sides of the door, you see what that's picturing? The cross and the lamb. And he says, if I see the blood, I will pass over you. In other words, he spared their lives. And so that night, in a remembrance of this event, of the atonement of the blood of the lamb, and also the picture, this provides the picture in the Old Testament of what we're going to see here in the New Testament. He's going to come, the true Messiah. 
So for 1,400 years, they celebrate, and they remember the lamb, they remember the meal, they remember all sitting the table, putting everything there, but they forget that they're to be looking for the Messiah. And at this table, as he serves this Passover, they're still not even getting that. He is the lamb. He is the Messiah. He is the one. He himself is that lamb that will shed his blood in just a matter of hours. He will pour out his blood to wash away the sins of the people. Religion clouds things. Anytime we get our hands on something and we try to, oh, we need to do this, this, and this, and we create all of these rituals and, and habits and get-togethers and celebrations and forget the very central part. And at this table, he is revealing himself as he serves them. He, he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He says, this is my blood. It is the covenant the New Testament, it is the fulfillment of all prophecy. He says, drink all of it. They're still not getting it. But they will. And I think that we need to remember to take these times seriously. As you celebrate the Lord's table and you go through this, it's not just to go through the motions, but to remember deeply what he has done. He has served the Passover. So when you use this word, he is a servant. He's not only serving the table, in other words, handing the elements out like, like a slave does. He is serving by giving his body and giving his blood for their life. It's an amazing, amazing thought when he identifies himself as a servant. And God says, my servant. It's an amazing, amazing thing. This happens 1,400 years, and with the passing of time, I think they forget that. So Jesus serves the meal. But secondly, he serves his Father. We realize that Christ came in obedience to his Father. It says that Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. So picture this. The Father sends the Son, and, and then the Son returns to the Father. So he is sent to serve. Jesus said, my will is to do, do the will of him that sent me. In other words, my meat or my food is to do the will of him that sent me. All through the New Testament, you're going to hear this again and again. I came to serve my Father. I came to do his will. It's not my will but his be done. And so even though he is equal with God, he takes upon himself the form of a servant. If you have time, just turn over to Philippians chapter 2. And I don't, I don't like to do this a lot with people flipping around all when I'm preaching a message. But this, this is an amazing, amazing text. Philippians chapter 2. And this, this talks about the mindset that, that Jesus had as a servant. And, and it's the same mindset that needs to get into every one of us. In verse 5 of Philippians 2, it says, Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. In other words, you need to have the same mind. Think in the same way as Christ. It says in verse 6, Who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant. Here we talk about he's the form of God, but he assumes the form of a servant. He has all the rights and the privileges and the equality with God, but he assumes the form. In other words, he makes a choice to step down in the form of a servant. And it says he was made in the likeness of man. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. So being a servant is humbling himself, being, becoming obedient 
even to death, the death on a cross. And then the next verse says, for this reason God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So if you think about this, when Jesus came into this world, it was a step down, right? And if we're going to follow Christ, we need to take a step down. We step down. We, oh, we may have rights, and we like to protect our rights, don't we? But he stepped down. He stepped down. And every step he took on this earth was a step down, a step down, a step down, a step down. It is not easy to step down. But this is the way that Jesus lived his life. In obedience to his father, he served his father and stepping down. And then at the end it says he steps up because he most glorifies his father when he serves in that way. And we bring, as we follow Christ, you and I, bring greater glory to God when we follow that same mindset. In Isaiah, and I won't have you turn there, but let me just read this to you because it's just, it's, this is 700 years before this Passover meal. 700 years, we read the prophet say this, See, my servant will be successful. He will be raised and lifted up and greatly exalted, just as many were appalled at you. His appearance was so disfigured that he did not look like a man, and his form did not resemble a human being. So he will, he will sprinkle or atone many nations. Kings will shut their mouths because of him, for they will see what they had not been told them, and they will understand what they had not heard. And then in chapter 53 of Isaiah, it says, Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed, he will prolong his days, and by his hand the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. After his anguish, listen to this, after his anguish, he will see light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. So Jesus could not accomplish what he did at Easter, the death, burial, and resurrection, unless he became a servant. This name is so significant that he became a servant. And we cannot represent our Christ and our God unless we follow him with that same mindset. Learning to become a servant. To follow him. I love verse 17 of chapter 13. <laughs> if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Now, <laughs> translating this from I know if I'm a servant, there's going to be more joy. Joy for the Father, joy for Christ, joy in my life if I learn to become a servant. I know that. But doing it, while, as the Apostle Paul would say in Romans 7, doing that is another thing. It's hard. It's difficult. So, he serves the Passover meal. He serves his Father. And now I want you to see, finally, he serves the world. Beginning with his disciples. He, he serves the lowliest of the low. He serves the world. And he serves them to the end. He loves them to the end. I love the last part of verse 1. It says he loves them to the end. And love is really expressed in what he does in service. You know, when those uh, disciples, they're coming up and um, up to the upper room, they're all gathering around and they're getting ready for the Passover. You know, excitement in the air, a little concern about what's really going on. But does anyone remember what they were arguing about? Who's the greatest? 
Now, we think, how terrible. You know, but we do that all the time. We, <laughs> you just watch, you look around, and it's, um, it's the way we're wired. Walking up into the room, how do, how do I read the room? How am I going to read this room? How do I fit? I wonder, I wonder who the greatest person is in here. <laughs> we probably not admit to that. When I was 12 years old, my dad got uh, transferred out to Maryland, and we were in a, a church there. It was a fairly large church, but the pastor of that church, Bob Crowley, took an interest in me. I'm, I'm 12 years old. He said, how would you like to go with me, up with me to Summit Lake Camp on Saturdays and just work? So he'd go up every Saturday. He had started the camp and uh, reached many, many children on the East Coast over there. And uh, so I'd go up and I'd cut grass and I'd got working with the horses. And he loved horses. I loved horses. And so I'd be, I got my start out there by shoveling manure and bucking hay and brushing down the horses. And, and after all that was done, I got to ride. <laughs> so that was the fun, fun thing for me. And once a month, he would pick me up on Friday night. We'd go up on Friday night because there was a big horse auction in Thurmont, Maryland. And everybody would come in from that area. And so we'd go to the horse auction. We probably had 20, 25 horses at Summit Lake Camp. And we had them for all the kids to ride and trail rides and so forth. And so we're constantly buying and selling horses. So when we go up there, you, you walk through the barn and you look in all the stalls. You can see the horse. You don't know how they perform or they function, but you can see how, how they look. And so you do all of that before the auction, and then they'll have someone ride the horse up and down the, the main alley there, so we have the stands up, and we'll, we'll sit there and watch. And I still remember when they, when they brought out this uh, gray-colored Appaloosa and ran them down the middle, and I looked at Pastor Crowd, and he go, his eyes got real big and thought, we want that horse. I thought, I hope he buys that horse. So he buys that horse. We got another uh, Morgan horse and brought them uh, back to the camp. Got a trailer and brought them back to the camp. And he said, I want you to watch this. We're going to turn these two horses loose with all the other 20-some horses out there. And I want you to watch what happens. So we're just watching. And they're just kind of moving around, looking at each other, moving around. Most of you know what I'm talking about. It's, it, what happens is they're going to find out their chickens. With chickens, it's the pecking order. With horses, I don't know if it's the kicking order, but you go, watch out. And there was a horse who kind of ruled all the other horses. His name was Thunder. And he, he was mean. He was, he was just mean. He was mean to people. He was mean to other horses. He had a horrible personality. You think, well, why would you have that as a camp horse he was fun to ride so we had him but he he kind of he was the main horse and it didn't take long for our new Appaloosa to kind of come on over there and the Appaloosa was interesting good with kids good with adults just the most calm mild horse and fun to ride and he walked right over to Thunder and just turned around and kicked him so hard. I mean, we could hear it, hear this grunt and groan. And then all of a sudden, the, the order got shifted. And Thunder didn't go to, you know, the, the horse that came in with the Appaloosa went to number two because you're new with me. And then you think, well, Thunder's number three. No, he went all the way to the bottom. I mean, he made sure, the Appaloosa made sure he went all the way to the bottom. So you reorder who is the greatest? I was reading an article not too long ago about, uh, about how people read a room and how they fit. And it's interesting. I'm, I'm not a psychologist, but they said that within the first five seconds when you walk into a room, a person's going to ask the questions, is this safe? Is it safe for me to be here? Um, how do I rank with the others in this room? Who can I trust? And then finally, what value can I bring? Just within five seconds, you, you're, you're, you're assessing where you fit. All of us, everyone here wants to be valued. We, we, we want to move up in respect. We, we desire that. We long for that. But this passage is calling us for willingly to be stepping down 
to be stepping down into that and not seeking after a higher rank. So I think that when it says in verse 1 that he loved his own and he loved them to the end. What do you think about that? He loved them to the end. And I think he shows it in two ways. Of course, the first way you think he loved them by dying. Um, he died on the cross. So that's like the, the, he loved them to the end. But I think that it's not just like giving up your life for them, but the endurance of it. And in some ways, it might be easier to die for someone than to live with them. You know, I, I think there are a lot of people I'd be willing to die for, my family and, and others. But you know what? You, you think that would to be to take upon the form of a servant and keep on serving and keep on serving and keep on serving and keep on putting myself below. Because think about, folks, he's washing the feet. He's washing their feet. Now, this was the job for the lowest slave in the house. That was, they, they washed feet in that day. We don't do it commonly now because uh, we wear shoes. They wore sandals so they could bathe themselves, but they walked to their neighbor's house and their feet get dusty. And so they, the, the custom is you come in and the lowest slave will wash your feet. It's a, they just do that for you. But this experience, it seems as though they all walked up there and no one even thought about it. And so he is making a point. He is making a point. He is going to love them to the end in the sense that he will die for them. But he also loved them to the end, knowing how their hearts would turn away these last hours. He would keep on loving them no matter what. So whose feet did he wash? Thomas. How do we remember Thomas? Thomas. It's kind of too bad that we have to remember him this way. Doubter. Do we doubt? Sure we do. You ever doubt God? You ever wonder if God's going to come through? He washed the ones who doubted him. Peter denied him. I mean, flat out. I don't know him. Three times. He predicted, even after he predicted it and told him that, he did it. Judas delivered him over to the council. He washed his feet, Judas's feet, and all the others, all of the others. Did you hear that? All of them deserted him. In his greatest hour of need, in his greatest hour of pain, they all deserted him. So in verse 12 of John 13, it says, When Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer clothing, he reclined again and said to them, do you know what I have done for you? See, this is the point. With all the stuff going on, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are speaking rightly, since that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. See, this kind of doubles down on the fact Jesus just washed my feet. Now he's saying, Peter, you washed Judas' feet. Judas, you washed Thomas' feet. He says, I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done for you if you know these things. Blessed are you if you do them. In verse 35 at the end, he says, in this way, you prove to be my disciples. You see, that is the kind of love demonstrated that proves the authenticity of Christianity. Say, what does a Christian look like? A bunch of good deeds? You do a lot of good things, nice things for people? How do you know you're a Christian? By the love that we have for one another. And the love expressed is exactly in this way, washing one another's feet. It is that mindset that we have. And so every leader that we look at in the Bible is seen by God that way. My servant, my servant, my servant, my servant. 
And he says, I've given you an example to do this. And so, you know, I, <clears throat> I pray for my kids every day, my grandkids every day. I pray that God would help them to become everything that they need to be and grow in their knowledge of God and grow in their capacity. But in some ways, you're praying every day for them to come to the heart of Christ, to learn to be like him, to be a servant. How do you see Christ? Do you see him as a baby? Do you hold the child? Do you see him as a man? Do you see him as God? Do you see him as the lamb? This morning, though, I hope we see him as a servant. Most of my life, I've been a pastor. There was a section uh, for about 11 years that we were in Wisconsin at a college. And one of the things that I remember about that is we, at the end of the school year, I'd stand up at, in the front and everybody, parents, families would be there, all the students graduated and have their robes on and they would come up the platform and we'd hand them their diploma. This, this is the certificate that you get for all the work that you've done. But after we did that, we'd take a towel and drape it over their arm. And on that towel it said, be great, serve. So the whole concept of this is if you have all this education and all of these degrees and all this head knowledge, but you can't learn to serve, you're not going to succeed in life. If you go into Reed's office, you can see that towel up on his bookshelf. And that is our prayer. That we want to grow, but we want to be like Christ. And I hope that this Easter, as we come into this, you can find great joy as you see him serving that table with himself. That you see him serving his father and fulfilling all his father's heart and desire. And to see him that he has served you. He has served you. He has served you. By not just laying down his life to save your soul, he has washed your feet. And he wants you to do the same. That's the Christ we follow. That's the Christ we represent. Let's bow together as we pray.